Hello friends, my name is Eric Strauss, I'm running for president in 2020, and as part of my presidential platform, I am advocating a, in favor of a universal basic income. That is to say, every American over a certain age will get a check every month, presumably, and here's my plan for how to do that. Now, you may recall that Bernie Sanders promised everybody free college, and he ran into the unfortunate thing called reality. You might think, well, Eric, how are you going to redistribute all that wealth without running into a similar problem? I've got a good plan for it, and here it is. So, foremost, let me address some framework issues. First of all, what is a universal basic income? A basic income is an income unconditionally granted to all members of society on an individual basis without means, test, or work requirement. It is a form of minimum income guarantee that is unconditional in three distinct senses. Individual, the right to it and its level are independent of household composition. Two, universal, it is paid irrespective of any income from other sources, which can therefore be added to the basis it provides. Three, it is free of counterpart. It is paid without requiring the performance of any work or the willingness to accept a job if it is offered. So there aren't any stipulations on it or anything like that. I'm going to share my screen so you can see this. Um, that's the first order of business. I would also say that wealth inequality is a significant matter of concern. Uh, policymakers need to focus on the poor and middle class, says Dabla Norris, 2015, International Monetary Fund. Work has shown that inequality matters for growth and sustainability. Income distribution itself matters for growth as well. Specifically, if the income share of the top 20% increases, the GDP growth actually declines. Benefits do not trickle down. And in contrast, an increase in the income share of the bottom 20% is associated with higher GDP growth. The poor and middle class matter the most for growth via a number of inter interrelated economic, social, and political challenge, uh, channels. So, uh, they also tell us this same article uh, that policies that focus on the poor and middle class can mitigate, mitigate inequality and can raise income share for the poor and middle class. Complementaries between growth and income inequality objectives suggest that policies aimed at raising average living standards can also influence the distribution of income and ensure a more inclusive prosperity. So, the thing is, our status quo approach to providing social safety nets does not work. Programs that provide in-kind assistance are bad. They infantilize the poor, they incentivize poverty, they incur bureaucratic waste, they distort the market, they don't reduce poverty. Tax credits and other such schemes don't provide direct assistance. Relieving the tax burden of low-earning individuals does not meet basic needs. And there are additional factors to consider. Income inequality is only meaningfully addressed by way of direct transfers of wealth. The literature has proposed several hypotheses which could explain why progressive redistribution may be growth enhancing. First, credit market imperfections may explain that redistributing capital from capital rich enterprises or individuals to capital poor and credit constrained people increases efficiency, investment, and growth. Second, political economy arguments have been proposed. Too much inequality in a redistributive democracy leads to more redistribution and uh, less capital accumulation. Alternatively, too much inequality may lead to social tension expressed through collectively organized or individually led violent redistribution, which is, of course, to be avoided. Yeah. Uh, Alright, there we go. Redistribution through social conflict and political instability are other channels which may relate inequality, inefficiency, or growth. Uh, these two argue that inequality can lead to less political stability, and this can in turn lead to suboptimal investment levels. Roderick finds countries experience the sharpest drops in growth after 1975 were those with divided societies and weak institutions. This cripples the ability of the political system to respond effectively to external shocks. Violence levels, as measured by homestead rates, have increasingly have recently increased sharply in the two most unequal regions in the world. The arguments summarized above tend to suggest that redistribution of wealth from rich to less rich, rich people will have a positive impact on growth. This may occur by correcting credit markets, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the point is that redistribution of wealth, not of income, may produce favorable effect of economic efficiency and growth. Income transfers that are not lump sum would have exactly the opposite effect of growth. That's the sort of in-kind benefits we have now in the status quo. By lowering the return 
The expected return from acquiring physical and human capital, they distort the economy and reduce savings and investment, and therefore the rate of growth. In order to be efficient in growth enhancing, individuals should be concerned with wealth rather than current income or consumption expenditures. So that's why universal basic income is the solution. It transfers wealth, not income, because of two reasons. It's progressively collected. All progressive tax scheme uh, progressive tax schemes means the rich pay more. The rich pay more under any tax scheme that's not directly regressive because they have to more total wealth to be taxed. It's not progressively distributed. Progressive distribution requires stipulations like means testing. Stipulations cause market distortions that slow growth and ultimately worsen or do nothing regarding inequality. Universal basic income pumps the collective tax revenue directly back into the economy, suffering no loss from bureaucratic inefficiency. Universal basic income benefits the economy in two ways. Pumps up consumer spending. The poor generally have a gap between need and attainment that means most of their money will go into consumer spending, which is the basic engine of the economy. And number two, an invest, increase in investment and growth. More well-off people will be more likely to invest the money to grow additional wealth. This infusion of capital allows entrepreneurs to create more wealth and jobs by enabling their business endeavors. Fourth, the crypto USD tax plan I, I present here funds and protects UBI. I advocate in general that replace, we replace existing social programs with UBI. However, if I don't, if we can't do that, and it seems highly unlikely that there's a political capital that's going to exist to do that. This plan means that UBI will require no expenditure of resources attained through taxation and the status quo. We're not going to be redirecting to existing tax revenue. This plan creates new wealth not formerly in existence and includes a homesteading component to guarantee equal access to the shared pool of resources. My crypto tax U reform plan is crypto U UBI, which is crypto USD for UBI, solves transnational migration concerns by collecting taxes from tra all transactions in the currency conducted anywhere in the world. Now, this is an article from 2015 by Van Perigius, Philippe, and Yannick Vanderbrot. It talks about some of the problems with redistributive policies. When firms and people are transnationally mobile, countries will tend to reduce the degree of redistribution in order to attract or keep taxpayers and businesses in order to dissuade social benefit claimants. But if, owing to the existence of some supranational redistributive scheme, the former contribute to some extent and the latter benefit to some extent, whether in or out of the country concerned, reducing the degree of, of international redistribution will be a less compelling option and the race to the bottom will be largely neutralized. However, as long as transnational redistribution across relevant countries is weak or inexistent, generous national redistribution will be highly vulnerable and overall character by high and increasing transnational mobility. So basically it says if you have immigration, you're going to have problems with redistribution policies because people are going to go where the, re the resources are being redistributed and leave places where their resources are being taken. Iran recently in created a, a resource linked plan that seems to work okay. The Iranian model may provide inspiration for other countries. Whenever one is seeking a sustainable new deal that combines ecological and social concerns, whether or not the country is resource rich, making resource consumption more expensive and distributing the corresponding additional revenues equally to all is an obvious option to consider. And that's exactly what crypto USD plan does. It dramatically increases tax revenues while dramatically lowering the tax burden for every American. It's, it's uh, international. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it's transnational and it's... Um, it makes resource consumption more expensive by taxing transactions rather than uh, rather than um, income or something like that. So it will dramatically increase tax revenue as well as dramatically lowering the tax burden and fully fund UBI with those increased tax revenues. It's four percent tax on each transaction. The tax is on transfers of wealth, not on. Not, not not based on reason. Wages, salaries, capital gains, profits taken in crypto USD are all subject to the same transaction tax as purchases, refunds, and other transfers of funds completed in the currency. The tax is taken on every transaction conducted in the currency, regardless of who, who conducts it or where in the world it's conducted. In other words, this is a tax on using the currency, not on anything more specific than that. The tax is built into the architecture of the currency. The absence of any way to access any information regarding a transaction other than the amount and time of the transaction is built into the blockchain architecture. This is a truly progressive tax and it is flat. Because it transfers taxes of because it taxes transfers of wealth, not receipt of wealth, those who move more money, always those who have more money, always pay ever more in taxes as they grow in wealth. In the status quo, transfers of wealth are distinguished according to their purpose. So if I spend money on my printer for work, that money doesn't count as income to be taxed. Such a system is regressive because the richest people are those who have the most justification for claiming exemptions from any large expenditures are the same population. 
The status quo is designed such that the rich will always avoid more taxes than anyone. After all, to exempt money from taxation requires a rich person to establish that the money was used to get more rich. That seems odd. Advantages over normal legislative action. This adds nothing to the debt. It adds no tax burden to the average American citizen. It funds UBI for Americans in part with taxes collected from foreign nationals. It requires no multiple legislative action. Other social programs are likely eventually to be repealed as UBI makes them redundant, but passing script of UBI affirms in a single legislative act while incurring no budgetary deficit or political harms. All right. Uh, real world solvency advocate is me. Meaningful reform of the tax system is likely impossible any other way. The income tax amendment makes it impossible to constrain future Congresses. This plan doesn't take any power away from Congress. It creates a system that renders Congress's constitutionally articulated power to collect the income tax moot by making it literally impossible for Congress to exercise that power over incomes realized in the cryptocurrency. This plan is likely to increase total tax revenue while eliminating forever all need for Congress to generate and all ability to effectively impose new tax law. This is my plan. Okay? It's for... A universal basic income and it is for the means to fund it and obviously it's a little dense people don't necessarily want to listen to it as I see everybody has left the room for room one I understand that I uh, if people have been involved in a conversation I would have gone to room one but it seems like everyone's just sitting around here so I thought I'd run by you if you are not interested in all those specifics that's fine the gist of it is this. You know, when I am president, I will do everything in my power to see every American cut a check every month from the U.S. government based on revenues that the U.S. government attains by a crypto USD. The 4%, like I said, is built into the blockchain architecture so that the money goes directly into the treasury and then the legislative action is simply to make sure that money goes directly back out to UBI. Can I constrain Congress in ways that won't allow them to redirect that money at some point? Mm, hard to say. But if UBI becomes deeply embedded as a cultural thing and people get very attached to it, it's going to be very politically difficult for Congress to, to, to then change that. It's the best I can hope for and the best I can promise regarding UBI. But I'll tell you this. If you want to see income inequality addressed and you're concerned about social justice and you're concerned about uh, social safety net and communitarian concerns like that you might not normally look at somebody who's fairly anti-statist like myself but the point is I'm not an ideologue I'm looking for meaningful solutions that afford everybody benefits and this is one such solution no other candidate is offering these kind of solutions vote for Strauss 2020 Thank you very much for watching, and God bless America. Spacey, you had something to say? What time is it? I forgot to ask you if you had anything to say. What time is it? Oh, no. Okay. It makes sense to me. Cool. Me too.